Thank you, Shaina. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening <laughs> to everyone. Thank you for joining me here uh, today. I am really excited about sharing a little bit more about my, my journey, my science journey. So I hope you like it. I hope you um, and I will have uh, an exchange after the presentation. So please feel free to ask any questions uh, that, that you may have. So let me know if you see, if you see my slides. Looks good. Excellent. Uh, th th those projects that we have had the, the, the honor to serve and, and the, the adventure of, of uh, working together on those as well. Um, so I am Dr. Jaira Sierra Sastre. I am a scientist. I am an educator. And today I am going to share a little bit more about my science journey from the nano world to planet Mars. You can find me in social media as Jerry Nelt, um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I usually use Facebook uh, for my Hispanic audience. So if you uh, hablas español y te gustaría conocer más sobre mí, puedes seguir en Facebook eh, porque pues en Facebook eh, pues posteo muchas cosas en español. Okay. So I am a Boricua as well. And every time I have a, a presentation, I, I, I like you know, uh, shouting that to the world. And the reason for that is because I, I owe my island of Puerto Rico, who I am today and the scientists that I have become. That's a beautiful picture of my hometown of Arroyo, the place where I, I was raised, uh, the place where I fell in love with the universe. So you can see beautiful mountains, Uh, next to the Caribbean Sea. So that's the place, that's the place where the scientist was born. And it didn't matter if it was the science um, under the blue sky or above it. I just fell in love. I fell in love with the universe. I fell in love with discovery, with adventures in, in what was my playground, right? That was my playground. And Today, I, I have the honor to serve and, and serve as a project manager, engineering project manager at NASA, specific, spe specifically the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. And working for NASA, you know, it was, I mean, it's a dream come true. Uh, back when I was little, you know, like as many, many of us <laughs> here in the, in the room, I, yeah, I was fascinated by the documentaries of the first man on the moon about spaceflight missions. Um, I told myself, yes, you want to be an astronaut. I, want, I wanted to be an astronaut someday. Um, and I had this dream of working for NASA. Um, and now at NASA, I am leading spaceflight projects, working, for, work, working with rovers, like big stuff. And as you will learn in this presentation, because I am going to share a lot, a lot more about my background, I am a nanotechnologist. I am a nanomaterials scientist. My training, my formal training in science is in the field of, you know, things and materials that you cannot see with your naked eye. And somehow I now I have ended up working for projects where I have to deal with macro, with the macro scale, with the big stuff like rovers, rovers that we'll be sending to the moon and Mars. And you, you will learn a lot more about that later on. And I owe my place in, at NASA uh, these days to all these experiences, all these life experiences, professional experiences, diverse experiences that I have had. I consider myself a scientist with many suits. So over the course of my career, I have, I have worn bunny suits when I used to do nanotechnology research, including room environments. I have also wore, worn simulated spacesuits. Um, I also, as part of my high seas experience, you know, did some type of like space chef activities, right? Um, evaluating and analyzing uh, future space food uh, systems for, for missions to, to, them, to Mars. And as a science educator, uh, before being a scientist, I was a teacher. And I will tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so I was a high school chemistry teacher so I have this, this passion uh, for, for science, for education, science communication. 
And somehow wearing all these suits, um, having the opportunity to serve in all these different types of roles, prepare me to the role that I am serving today. And to give you a little bit more of a, of, of a snapshot of my academic career, um, because certainly it's not, has been, it, it, not, it has not been a traditional uh, path. Uh, it, it has not been a straight path. Um, I started uh, my, my academic career back in Puerto Rico at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. Um, I started in engineering, then switched to chemistry, thanks to my general chemistry professor, my freshman chemistry professor. She had this ability to explain chemistry concepts that I can tell you, I could see molecules all around me. So I just fell in love with chemistry. I fell in love with chemistry and decided to pursue a major in chemistry. But I was also very inspired by her, by her ability to teach. And also I believe uh, my, the influence from my mother who, who was a teacher for many, many years um, inspired in me or, or instilled in me a curiosity for the science of teaching, the science of education, how, how we could teach and communicate science and teach science in a way that is engaging, in a way that is relevant, in a gauge that students um, will, will get excited about. So besides working on my bachelor's degree in chemistry, I also finished a certification, teaching certification. And I launched my, I, my, I landed my first job at my former high school. So I graduated from, from, my, from university. And then my very first job was as a high school chemistry teacher. So you see me there at 20, 22, I think, 22 years old um, with, with these high school students uh, my, my, some of my high, my high school uh, chemistry students. And it was, um, it was a great experience. Um, it was a great experience. So serving as a teacher of, um, in the public educational system of Puerto Rico in my former high school, um, I really enjoy, I really enjoy my teaching, my teaching job. But it was a temporary position. Back then, um, there were not that many open positions for chemistry uh, teachers open in that area, it was a temporary position. So at the end of the, of the academic year, I had to ask the question of, okay, what's next? What should I do? Now I need to try to figure out, you know, what, what I do next. And in me, there was still this curiosity about exploring research. Um, so, um, I mean, most people nowadays, right? We know that most students in STEM, they will do or they will have some sort of research experience uh, throughout their college uh, years, college career. Um, in my case, I, I had none, I had zero. Um, I don't know if it was, uh, you know, a situation, you know, with, you know, lack of internet access at, the, at that time um, that, I could not even like, I, I don't remember even like being aware that that, that was a thing, that, what, that was like, th that those were opportunities available for me. So I didn't get any, any research experience during my, my college years. Um, most of my research experience was in high school and in middle school when I was participating in, in science fair projects. Uh, so after that year as a teacher, I decided to look, and back then it was Yahoo, I mean, the browser that we would use, the search engine. So I started looking for research experiences for teachers. And that's how I found out about these um, research, uh, summer research experience for teachers program at Stanford University. And that was a very big deal for me. Why? Because it was my first time leaving my, my, my island. Um, my first language is Spanish. Back then, I was not fluent in English at all. I mean, when I tell you that I was not fluent in English, I was not fluent in, in English. And, but I said, you know, let, let, me, let me apply and see what happens. To my surprise, I mean, I got selected, got there. Um, wow, what a tough experience uh, in terms of, you know, getting to understand people, but what an empowering, empowering experience I had. Uh, because at the end of the summer, um, even with my limitations with English, I was able to do research. I was able to participate in research, in research and contribute to research. 
I was um, able to write a paper and, and you know, um, work on my poster uh, for, for the end of the program. It was a very empowering experience. And after that, I said, hey, you, you can do this. You can go to an Ivy League, you can uh, do research at one of the, you were able to do research at one of the main institutions um, in the mainland. You can do this. So I went back to Puerto Rico and started uh, taking courses so that, uh, graduate courses, uh, since I was out uh, for, for a few years, um, I, I was out from, from school. So I went back to school, started taking graduate courses in chemistry, started knocking on doors um, and found uh, a wonderful professor and mentor, Carlos Cabrera, who opened the doors of his lab. And there I started doing nanotechnology research, a nanotechnology research with applications in space. So that was the first time I was able to kind of like make a connection uh, between an area of research that I was just, just starting to learn about nano, nano stuff and space. And that research experience um, really prepared me to then apply for graduate uh, uh, school um, in the US mainland. I, I really wanted to continue you know, improving my, my English speaking skills. And I just had this, I don't know, I, I had this desire to, to, for an adventure, to go, to go and have an adventure. As an islander, I just wanted to go out and explore the world. And I decided to go also very like, very big. I said, okay, if I am going to leave my island to do graduate uh, studies, let me apply to the Ivy Leagues. And um, I was able to convince them. Uh, and I, 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 I can say that my, my unique non-traditional background, I think it appealed to, to my school. And I ended up being, apply, uh, being accepted at Cornell University. And during those five years, um, I basically spent five years there at, at my alma mater, Cornell, just doing research. I mean, I was really focused on the goal of you, you have to finish this degree. You are not going anywhere. And I wanted to be successful uh, uh, throughout the, my uh, graduate school career. So I at the end, I uh, graduated with a PhD in nanomaterials, nanomaterials for, for, from Cornell. And since you are tech, a techie and nerd, nerdy audience, the audience, I would like to tell you a little bit more about nano stuff. But my intention is you know, not just lecture you about you know, and, and bring in science jargon. I want you to, to see how everything seems to be interconnected. Because sometimes when I tell my story, like, and I just, you know, give my elevator speech, some people are like, what? Like from nano to, to robots to rovers. And people don't necessarily get it the first time. But things are very interconnected. Um, skills, regardless of where you develop those skills and to, in which industries you are developing yourself, I believe there are lots of transferable skills that can uh, set the path or pave the path uh, for a career in aerospace. And in my case, during my PhD, as I mentioned, um, so it, it, it was a degree in man, nanomaterials chemistry. So to define a little bit, what is that? So I, I was um, like an architect, architect of small things. So I design materials at the atomic scale. I synthesize, like make these materials in the lab. And then I would use, and this is what is kind of like, exciting for me um, because back then it was like a sci-fi type of project. Um, I would use biomolecular scaffolds, templates, natural biomacromolecules that you find in nature, and I would use them as templates to arrange those nanomaterials in very specific patterns and configurations and arrays that could be, could you, could be utilized in the nanotechnology world for other types of applications that are not bio-related, especially in the electronics um, uh, in the electronics field and as well as battery fields. And what you see here is three images of DNA, strands of DNA, and what you see, well, you don't see the DNA, what you are seeing some, some dark dots, right? So those are nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles that bind to the, to the backbone of that DNA uh, strand. You see a virus, um, uh, image, right, and, a, and an artistic rendering of, the of, of a virus structure. And those yellow uh, 
dots there are also gold nanoparticles, metallic nanoparticles that bind due to these physical chemical um, um, interactions between, between the metal and those functional groups that we find in these type of biomacromolecules. Macromolecules. And then protein, protein lattices like the S layer, surface layer protein that is found in many, many bacteria, including um, um, uh, bacteria that um, is known as, as, as extremophiles. So you, not all, all of, the, of you that work in, in the area of astrobiology know what I'm talking about, right? Um, organisms that live in very extreme environments. So those organisms usually have very, very unique, interesting protein shell structures that nanotechnologies have looked at, the, at those structures, have extracted those proteins from, from these microorganisms, and then apply or deposit these protein layers on the surface of a silicon wafer to arrange all sorts of all sorts of nanomaterials. And um, I work with metallic nanoparticles. Um, I use that protein layer, S layer protein, to arrange um, gold nanoparticles, as you see here, in hexa hex hexagons or um, honeycomb-like patterns. Um, my lab also work, uh, several team members of my lab would arrange quantum dots. You, you may have heard about quantum dots as well. Um, really, really cool stuff. Because for me, what the coolest factor of my research project was like, okay, it was highly interdisciplinary. So I had to learn about microbes and my, microbiology techniques, but solid state chemistry as well, because and then I was synthesizing, you know, making uh, these, these inorganic nanostructures or nanomaterials, um, materials, property relationships. It was highly disciplinary and I really like it. And then the sci-fi factor of what we are using these nano, nano, nano natural structures to make materials for, for a myriad of applications. So I really love it. I really love it. From nanoparticles to nanowires. I mean, those um, uh, kind of like needle type of structures that you see there are semiconductor nanowires, germanium nanowires that, that I was able to grow using these type of biotemplated gold nanoparticle um, arrays. Awesome stuff. I mean, I, I hope that you, you get the excitement that I get when I talk about this because it was, it was an amazing, an amazing experience doing research. Um, and then, you know, after five years, it's like, whoop, okay, it's time to graduate. It's time to write a thesis, um, a thesis. And it's time, you know, it's graduation day. And that's my mother. And that's the superstar in my life. I mean, I owe her everything I am today, uh, where, where I have gotten. I mean, she's, she's, the, she's the superstar in my life. And what an amazing day was uh, graduation day. What an amazing day. Um, after that, you know, okay, so now I am a PhD Cornell graduate. Um, and so what, right? And, and what, what else? So after the PhD, I, all I had you know, at the moment was my nanotechnology toolbox. I was highly specialized <laughs> in these different areas uh, from biophysical chemistry to surface chemistry, solid state chemistry, materials, synthesis, microscopy, nanotechnology, et cetera, et cetera. So I started looking, okay, what's, what's next um, in my career? I mean, it was time to work. It, it was time to uh, find a job. And one of my uh, coworkers or lab mates uh, was starting a startup. I mean, he was, uh, he, he, he got, uh, uh, he founded a startup at the moment and it was a nanotech startup. And he asked me, would you be interested in joining the startup? And, you know, there, there were no like other, other, other opportunities in the horizon. And that was, that one sounded very interesting. So I said, okay, oh, hell yeah, let's, let's do it. So I was, I was working with him as, and I was the first full-time employee at that startup um, and once again is you know I decided not to go through the postdoc uh, route or path um, I decided to to pursue a career outside academia and and specifically in the startup environment is in the startup world and I can tell you like in my I look back and I am like yes that was for, for me that was the best decision that I could have taken because I, I grew up as, a, I, I, I mean, I, I grew and, and developed as a scientist in ways um, like, you know, that I, I, I never imagined. I mean, I, my creativity really, 
really was like sparked like during those years, but not just science. I mean, I was able to expo to be exposed to the business side of science, um, writing proposals um, to get to get funding, um, issuing like drafting patent applications. I got I I I got you know a patent uh, from 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 the work that I conducted there. Um, so many areas of business um, of, of, of science or the business side of science that usually we are not exposed in academia. So lots of new skills, right, that were added uh, to, to, my, to my scientific skills, thanks to, you know, the, this type of like dynamic um, startup type of environment and experience. Um, and after serving for, for two startups, uh, one, one of them I fiber, I was mainly focused on nanotextiles. Uh, so we were looking and at developing mat nanomaterials that could be applied to garments, to different types of textiles, as well as nanomaterials that could be applied to biomedical devices. Um, so that from there to Primate, where I serve as a contractor, as a microscopist, looking at nanomaterials that um, are being used for lithium ion batteries. Um, so lots of diverse experiences and great experiences. Um, but by the end of 2013, it had been already like since 2004, like almost 10 years, um, just working on research and, and very, very, very focused on, on, on these professional goals and, and what I needed to do at the moment um, that I can tell you that there, there was a time where I had to find myself in research. And what I mean with that is it was a moment where I realized that, you know, I need to, I need to get, I, I need to go back and reconnect to those passions, to those passions um, that were my childhood passions, to those passions that I have had. And sometimes it, those, those passions that come and go or those dreams that don't abandon you, that come and maybe you kind of like try to ignore them and not think about it, but they keep coming. And that's how I decided, you know what? I have always loved space. I didn't know how to get there. Um, I wanted to be an astronaut, I know that, but even, even then I was like a little bit lost about how, how to make that happen. Um, and I said, you know, let, let, me, let me start searching for opportunities to apply my research background or, or pursue research in, in, the, in the field of space, space, space exploration. And that's how I ended up um, um, applying for high seas, applying for high seas. And I will tell a little bit more about that. Um, and after that, you know, like other experiences, and I will show you some pictures and, and give you more context later on. Uh, but from high seas, going back to earth, uh, to work on earthbound <laughs> applications or industries that are not related to space. But again, opportunities, um, career opportunities that created new opportunities for me and added skills uh, such as, you know, project management skills. I, I believe that um, job that I had at the U.S. Money Factory, the U.S. Bureau of Engraving and Printing, this is a, a federal agency, the agency of the, federal, of the US federal government, the, the Department of Treasury. That experience as a project management manager there really, really like added that dimension to what is now my role at NASA as a project manager for, for space flight projects. So more nanomaterials, just to give you a little bit, a little bit more uh, examples of the type of nanomaterials that I work in the startup. So we will look at nature, uh, get um, inspired by nature. So there is something called the lotus effect. Um, it's a lotus, so it's a leaf that you find in ponds. It's a, it's a leaf that has like self-cleaning properties. And when you look at them through the microscope, you see these type of microstructures. So as, so as nanotechnologies, we try to mimic um, or, or we get inspired by nature and mimic those nanostructures to create this type of water and oil repellent um, coatings on fabrics. Um, or, you know, nano, nanofibers that could be used for wound dressing applications, nanofibers that encapsulate drugs um, and help in, in, you know, help release the drugs at, at a certain rate. 
And those are nanofiber materials, um, electrospond fibers that can be easily applied to, to wound dressings, for instance, or microspheres as sensors. So lots of applications, nothing related to space yet, right? <laughs> So and as I told you, you know, that after that startup experience, it was my time to find myself in research, reconnect to my passion for education. So I started engaging more uh, with nonprofit organizations, uh, focus on science education and public outreach, um, volunteering a lot of my time to, to participate um, in, in outreach events at the National Air and Space Museum. Very, very fun stuff. Very fun stuff. And as I mentioned to you, yeah, like getting to get into Mars or pseudo Mars there in Hawaii. Um, as Shaina, we, we were part of these NASA funded of the first series of missions that were funded by NASA, by the NASA's human um, research program to evaluate different types of um, risk and, 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 and needs associated with enabling uh, future missions to, to the red planet. And as part of, at, at for me, as part of uh, my application to the high seas program and to this NASA funded project, I had to submit a proposal. And I made the connection thanks to those past experiences. I, I, I got the connection and the idea right there. I said, well, um, I have been working in nanotechnology. I work for the startups developing nanomaterials for textiles. I know that those nanomaterials can render um, or can provide uh, pro um, anti, you know, stain or anti other properties to to fabrics and, and textiles and garments. So let me propose to High Seas that what I wanted to do, and then that's what I did. Like I proposed that I wanted to conduct a research project to evaluate different types of the different types of nano textiles um, for long duration space flight missions. And we evaluated from um, all, all different types of textiles. I mean, from towels to bed sheets to garments uh, that, the, that the team um, wore for extended periods of time, lots of stuff. So that proposal, um, the PI is really liked it. Um, it, was, it was a really fun project to work, uh, to work on and work with um, during the mission. This is my crew, um, my crew from high seas. You see here, Cyan Proctor, astronaut Cyan Proctor. We are very proud of her, um, astronaut of the Inspiration4 mission. Um, what an awesome experience, as, as Trina said. And, and it has been a highlight of my career in many ways. I mean, it was an adventure. I was able to do a lot of research, a lot of, um, a, a lot of collaborations. Um, let me show you there. I'm showing you the, the the tiny tiny rooms, right, where we where we used to sleep. The one of two windows that we had <laughs> um, available to look at the outside. Um, the different types of freeze dried foods that we we or or ingredients that we use uh, to to create the different types of Martian recipes, and and a picture of me doing a performing a, a, a simulated TVA over there in Mauna Loa. And as part of the, as part of the four uh, month long mission, um, we, yeah, we had to exercise as astronauts, exercise at the interna in the International Space Station. But what you, what you see there is us, three of us are wearing um, some shirts that were provided by Johnson Space Center. These shirts uh, were part of a blind study where we had to wear, uh, start wearing a t-shirt. Uh, they provided us the order of, of, of you know, what, what t-shirts we, need, we needed to wear. And those t-shirts needed to be worn day after day, you know, well, you know, during exercises. This was, this was an exercise um, textile study. And some of these, uh, some of the best performers uh, flew to the ISS as part of a technology demonstration study. So we were part of that. Um, these were garments that some of them had uh, nice coatings, uh, others didn't have it. We didn't know what we were wearing, but what JSC was interested was, you know, in looking at um, the subjective evaluation of these textiles, of these um, exercise t-shirts, um, how like the, the user would rank uh, different types of, of subjective characteristics like you know the comfort or other or 
um, whether it felt clammy or heavy or et cetera, et cetera, or whether they were bored about wearing the same t-shirt over and over. And it, that was for me an eye opener for, because as a material scientist, right? Like we, we can just spend hours and hours in the lab um, having a lot of fun, designing like all these awesome nanomaterials that then when you look through them under the microscope, um, um, powerful, uh, using powerful ele ele electron microscopes, um, you get very excited about what you're seeing. But this experience was, for me as a material scientist, it was my, my first opportunity to work in the intersection uh, between material science, human factors, and it was a, a real eye opener because it, it then it kind of like set that mindset of, you know what, as a scientist uh, working on materials, it's really important for you to always think about the end user. And there are factors that go beyond the, uh, you know, the, the amazing, awesome properties that these materials can provide. There are psychological factors and, and, and human factors that need to be taken into consideration when designing these type of, of technologies. So very, very cool stuff. So after four months of living um, on, on pseudo Mars, it was time to go back to, to Earth. And um, I am not showing it here, but my first, like I, I, I worked for one year as a, as a uh, assistant uh, professor or, or, or lecturer at, at CONI, the Center University of New York. And then after that, um, my husband and I wanted to just uh, go to the next adventure. Uh, we had spent a lot of time in Ithaca, New York, where Cornell is. And I, we wanted to, to move out and just, just go to our next adventure. And that's how I ended up in, in DC, Washington, DC, working as a civil servant for, for the US federal government. And as I mentioned, um, uh, my, my first uh, agency, uh, um, that I serve was the US Bureau of, en of Engraving and Printing. This is the US Money Factory. That's the place there, that's the, the building where we, we print this. And people are like, what? We are, now we are printing paper money, but no, not that many people know that this paper money behaves like a, like a cotton t-shirt. So it's a textile. And many of the anti-counterfeiting um, materials and uh, anti-counterfeiting technologies that are present here um, need to take into consideration materials science um, principles uh, about structure, microstructure, and, and light interactions uh, to provide the user, to provide the cashier um, with some uh, security features that will help the cashier uh, make a determination about whether this um, uh, bill is real or not. So not related to space, right? But it was an experience that exposed me to project management since I had to uh, lead different types of uh, material science projects for to develop the next generation of security features. Uh, but also it was a job that exposed me to uh, science policy as well. So I was able to engage with uh, the subcommittee for nanoscales, science and engineering. Um, NSET um, is a subcommittee of the White House uh, Science and Technology Council. Um, so getting exposed to that, that experience of, of working in DC and working as well in the, in the at the intersection of you know science and policy that that was that was actually something really cool and again that set my path set my path to nasa so after after five years working there um yes i mean i i i develop as a project manager but once again i had to find myself in in my research in my career and reconnect to that passion for space and that was the moment where I said, you know, I, yeah, I really need to maybe start getting uh, more, more like all out there, um, telling the world, you know, that yes, I want to work for space. I want to work for NASA, started applying for NASA jobs, um, lots of, lots of applications. Okay. Um, and it was at that conference where I met some NASA folks from NASA Glenn. 
And I decided, you know what, you cannot be shy anymore. Just tell these people that, hey, that you have been applying to NASA, that you have not been successful uh, with the applications, but that, you know, and present yourself, just sell yourself. And that's, that's exactly what I did. I, I met people, I met leaders from, from NASA that then introduced, introduced me to other people. And um, do, through, through those interactions, um, yeah, I, I was asked, yeah, send us your resume. And I guess I was at the right time in the right place because at that moment, the agency was looking for, for to fill a position for a project manager for the Mars Spring Tire project. So now it's like Mars and you will learn about those spring tires uh, soon. Um, it, 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 you will learn, you, you will see, you will see the connection. You will see the connection. So that's me, super happy uh, in front of my NASA Center, NASA Glenn Research Center. And as I mentioned earlier, yeah, now it's, I am a project manager working for space flight projects for the moon and Mars. Um, this is an artistic rendering of, and what you see there is like a lot of action, you know, uh, on the moon, what we envision to do um, at the moon when we go there. And you see different types of mobility systems, different types of mobility systems. And that's here as well. I mean, you see the lunar terrain vehicle, like a concept of a lunar terrain vehicle. And here in the background, you see the Viper, the Lunar Viper rover that is a scientific, scientific rover that will search for water ice. And I am working on that one. I am working on that one. So I was now introduced to this field of rovers and mobility systems um, and Artemis and future rover, future missions uh, to, to the moon and Mars and missions that will require different types of mobility systems. Um, because we are going back to the moon to stay, we are going back to the moon to learn how to live there in preparation for our future, um, future uh, missions to Mars. So there will be lots of activities and many of those activities to, that will be needed to sustain life um, on the surface of the moon will require mobility systems as I mentioned. So NASA through the Artemis program is preparing for Mars and there will be several missions that will be sent to, that will be sent to the moon. Uh, there will be uh, these pre-Artemis missions um, like the Viper uh, rover. This is the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. Um, and again, this, this is my second project. My main project is the Mars Spring Tire. And two weeks, after, two weeks um, after in starting my, my job at NASA, I was, I was asked, would you be interested? And that was tough because imagine just starting a job, um, learning, I mean, I, I, I had to learn a lot about the new organization and the NASA processes, et cetera, et cetera, um, that I was like, oh my goodness, I don't know if I will be able to do this, but I could not say no. I, I could not say no. I said, eh, I want Mars, but I also want mo the moon. And what I told my supervisor was, you know what, I, I want to be exposed and serve as many spaces <laughs> as I can. Um, I, 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 and I just, I just said yes. And it has been a lot of fun to work for, for this uh, Viper project. This will be um, the first um, uh, ro US NASA rover that we'll be sending to the South Pole is, is the first rover to wear a headlamp. It will have some science payloads. It will have a drill and it will look at characterizing the water distribution and, and water composition and other different types of volatile, um, uh, volatiles in that area of the lunar south pole. And this is an awesome picture of a prototype of that rover at the simulated lunar operations laboratory. This is a laboratory at NASA Glenn uh, where we do the type of mobility testing. Um, so folks from JSC and NASA Ames uh, come to Glenn and together as a team, we have been testing different prototypes of, of, the, of this lunar rover. I love this picture. I had to include it in, in here. Uh, that's me with the Viper engineers, female engineers, badass engineers. Um, I love it. It has been such a pleasure to work with, 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 these, with these women. 
And what an awesome place to work. I, what an awesome, I need to pinch myself every time I go to that lab because it's like, wow, yeah, it's, 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 it's really a dream come true. Um, and you see a lot of sand there and you see this platform that is actual an actual slope that we can we can vary the the, the angle of that slope um, and the sand over there it's is a simulated regolith so you see the engineers working um, with their protective equipment uh, because these are you know like uh, yeah my micro scale as well uh, materials that simulate um, the the characteristics of, of different types of soil um, on on the moon or, or Mars. Awesome stuff, awesome stuff. So there we are, um, in case you go to Glenn um, and have the opportunity to tour uh, our, our facilities, um, let me know, let me know so that I make sure that I meet you, I meet you someday. And that takes us to Mars, uh, from the moon, lunar uh, Viper rover to Mars. Uh, you know about Perseverance, you have heard about Perseverance, we are, extremely excited um, and celebrating, you know, the first anniversary of Perseverance on the surface of Mars. Um, Perseverance is in Jezero Crater right now, an area of um, scientific importance and interest because there was a, uh, there is a delta there, there was a river there, um, the geologic structures um, tell scientists that there, there was flowing water there and where there is water uh, or there was water, there was also the potential for life. And that's the question that we would like to answer, whether or not there, there was life, microbial life on the red planet. So this uh, Perseverance mission is looking at characterizing the geology in that region, is looking at um, taking Martian samples, rock samples for what will be the Mars sample return. And that's the Martian mission I am, I am part of. Um, so Mars sample return is the, the, the series of missions that will follow Perseverance. So Perseverance right now is collecting uh, samples, putting them in tubes. Those tubes will be uh, left by Perseverance or, or located in depot locations, um, specific, uh, specified locations that then uh, the next rover, the FETCH rover that is currently built by ESA, um, that rover will be collecting those samples on the surface on the surface of, 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 of Mars to bring them back to a rocket. And let me show you some artistic renderings of what that will look like. Um, so there will be a lander that will deploy that uh, fetch rover uh, to the surface of Mars, then that fetch rover, and then you start seeing some new characteristics for those wheels, those tires. That fetch rover is the one that will be responsible for um, going around the surface, collecting those tubes, helping Perseverance um, with getting those tubes back to, to the Mars Ascent vehicle, uh, the rocket that will, will be launching from the surface of Mars. Um, so as you see there, it's, um, it's a rover with a robotic arm, it's a rover with flexible tires. So you will be seeing in the future, of these Mars uh, robotic exploration missions, you will be seeing rovers that are using flexible tires, not rigid wheels that like the ones that Perseverance has or, or, or the Curiosity rover has. And the reason for that is um, we have identified a NASA uh, a, a, a technology need uh, to create flexible tires that will help that rover um, traverse uh, the harsh uh, Martian terrain. Uh, tires that are made of materials, I will tell you a little bit more about that, um, that help those tires be more durable and help the, the, the rover um, overcome obstacles such as rocks. So that rover will go back to, to a rocket, the Mars Ascent vehicle. For the very first time, we will see a rocket um, launching from Mars blasting off from Mars. And that rocket then will go to the Martian orbit where there will be a transfer of the sample um, container from one spacecraft to another to then bring those samples uh, uh, back to Earth, bring the samples um, um, back to Earth for further analysis. Um, we can do a lot on Mars right now, 
um, um, a lot, but a lot more can be done if we can start using molecular analytical tools um, to actually look, you know, at the at the molecular um, characteristics of these samples and and with more definitive um, tools answer the question about whether or not we could find uh, biosignatures in those Mar uh, Martian samples. Awesome stuff. And rovers and what Jahaira is doing. Well, I am the project manager for the Mars Spring Tire. And these flexible tires, as, as I mentioned, are made of shape memory alloy materials, materials that have an ability to reverse to its original state and shape, um, materials that have shown be very durable at the stream conditions, Martian conditions. So we have designed um, at NASA Glenn materials that can withstand the stream environments of Mars. And what an awesome, uh, an awesome job. And what an awesome connection because yeah, Chave Memorial is, you know, I have, I have Chave Memorial experts in my team, uh, but bringing as a project manager, having that material science background has helped me as well, you know, translate a lot of, you know, uh, of, of the concepts and, 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 and be, be the, the, the communicator between, you know, the administration, uh, the administration team and, and scientific team, engineering team, et cetera. So very, very nice, very nice way <laughs> of ending, um, of ending, ending up, uh, you know, in, in this role uh, that, um, that takes into account or, or is involved as well with uh, the incorporation of novel materials uh, for tire development. Awesome stuff. And to, to finish so that we can go to the Q&A, um, I would love to have a conversation with you. Um, things that I have learned, I wanted, I wanted to come up with three, uh, three lessons that, I, that this Martian has learned uh, throughout, throughout her career. And, and I would like to share those. Um, I would say live a simulation. I, I feel that every, every stage of my career, um, I have needed to, and, and, and there, there, there is like a term for that or, or a saying like fake it until you make it like, and, and not necessarily fake it, but you know, I don't necessarily felt ready uh, for all the jobs and different roles that I had to serve at, at different times in my career and my life. But I just, I just play with it. I just live the simulation. I, I use the opportunity to then learn as we learn during the high seas mission, let's just you know, work on that role, learn as we walk and just get better and better at it. Um, leave a simulation in your career and be okay with being uncomfortable. Uh, certainly this type of career transitions, this type of you know, career reinventions are not easy. And we can talk about that in the Q&A are not easy, they are painful, they are painful. They were more and more difficult at the beginning and with time and with experience and with just exposing yourself to uncomfortable situations, you start learning how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And you can manage you know, that you know, uncomfortable feeling of just being exposed to either a new field of research or or a new project outside, outside your area of expertise, you just get more comfortable and more confident as well, because you know that, okay, if I did it in the past, I know that I can do it. I can partake on a new challenge. I can work with rovers. I can do it uh, because I was able to, to do it in the past um, when, when, I, when I had to work those career transitions. And bring out the Martian within you. And with that, what I would like to say is, the moments I have been able and the places in my, in my life, in my career, in my profession, where I have been able to, to bring who I am, like the full Jahaira, who I am, my entire self to the table, those are the moments where I have best served the mission at hand and the moments where I have best served my organization. I am glad and I can honestly tell you, I, these two years in, in, at NASA, those, those two, these two years have been wonderful. Um, I have found an institution that embraces diversity. Here I am, a Latina, leading this team for a very, very important mission for NASA and humanity. 
And I just, I have just learned throughout the, through, throughout, you know, this path um, in my path in science that, you know what, you don't need to, you, you, you don't need to pretend to be someone that you are not. You don't need to try to clone, you know, or, or shape yourself to, to be like the people that, you know, that surround you that you mo most often see, just be yourself. And with that, I can tell you, I, I have learned that my biculturalism, my, those experiences in Puerto Rico, the people skills that I, that I develop learning, you know, growing in a community center culture, those things, all those things, I have brought those things to the table and put them to practice to better serve my teams. So with that, I, I just want to tell you just Martians, just bring them, bring out the Martian within you. Just be yourself, embrace your authenticity um, because we want to, we want to someday be able to have fun on Mars, right? Uh, we would like to see a future where we will actually go to Mars and, and, and rover Mars um, and have fun in these, in, in these other places in our solar system. So with that said, thank you for your attention. And then I, I am here for, for questions to answer any questions. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, that's a great photo of you. Would you like to tell everybody where you are in this photo in case they don't yes. know? Yes, that was in the Utah, uh, the Utah desert in the, as part of the, so the high seas crew uh, went to the Mars desert research station in Utah um, to kind of practice before our, our four month uh, simulation. So there, there I am um, just, uh, like, yeah, playing to be an astronaut, um, uh, working and training to, to what was, you know, what was about to happen at the moment, that, that was a long time, long, long duration mission with high seas. Um, yeah, I love that picture. It, I love that picture of, it is, yeah, it's, I mean, just seeing myself uh, accomplishing that dream without escaping Earth, right? <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. All right, everybody. So I'm going to um, turn off the recording so that people can freely and without any concern for becoming YouTube star, ask their questions. So we're going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording.